Welcome to everybody to TCARAM uh, trainee rounds. Uh, I'm Laura Rosella. I'm the education lead uh, part of TCARAM. And just to remind everyone what the purpose of these rounds are, they are to profile some of our top trainee talent in AI and medicine at the University of Toronto. Uh, the, this speaker series is a competitive speaker series, meaning uh, the speakers that you hear from were selected from a pool, a wide pool of, of those that applied. And these are uh, the cream of the crop, if you will. So a great opportunity to hear from a variety of content areas. We have two amazing talks today. So very excited uh, and thank you all for joining. Um, I'm gonna start off, we're, we're hearing from Nathpreet Kambaj and Ryan Daniel today. Nathpreet's going first. So I'm gonna start off by introducing Nathpreet and uh, just a couple housekeeping items. If everyone can please uh, mute and also while the presentation is happening, uh, turn off their cameras, but the chat is live if you have questions throughout the the talk, just put them in the chat and I will collect them and make sure that Nafri gets a chance to answer them at the end of her speaking time. Uh, and uh, also, you know, I'll open it up if you want to ask questions and turn your camera on and interact during the question uh, and answer portion, that would be fantastic. So if uh, there are no pressing issues, maybe we'll go ahead and get started. Nafri, I'll invite you just to start loading up your presentation and I can introduce you. So Navpri Kambaj holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Ryerson University and a Master of Science in Nursing from Western University. And she's now a PhD student at the Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing here at the University of Toronto. Navpri's a registered nurse at Trillium Health Partners. And her research focuses on developing a nitroglycerine dose titration decision support system to assist nurses' decision-making about dose titration. So this is a a really important issue, uh, a really excellent example um, of AI and healthcare. And just to say, Nafpreet's incredibly passionate about health informatics and AI to support nursing care. I think this is an area of tremendous potential and we're just thrilled to have you uh, present today. So over to you, Nafpreet. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks okay. great. Perfect. So thank you for inviting me to present my research today. Um, I do want to apologize. I'm just recovering. So my voice isn't 100% there. Um, hopefully it lasts throughout the presentation. So my talk is on developing a nitroglycerin dose titration decision support system. And um, my name is Nefried. I'm a PhD student at the Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing. Um, so in the hospital, specifically looking at critical care, there are many alarm embedded devices which are used to help nurses alert them of any changes in a patient's condition. None of these devices are perfect. So a perfect system would be that it only triggers an alarm when there's a true actionable event and it doesn't when there isn't. But the devices that we use are highly sensitive. So an important event isn't missed, but this also means that it produces a lot of false alarms um, that require no action and are really clinically insignificant. Um, in fact, in a given cardiac unit, there can be about 12,000 alarms per day. And in a critical care nurse's shift, it's about 1,000 alarm. And up to 99% of these are clinically insignificant. So this is a problem because over time, this constant exposure to alarms leads to nurses becoming desensitized. So they're not alert to these alarms causing delayed or there's no response at all when it is triggered. Um, this is called alarm fatigue. It's, a, it's considered the number one patient safety hazard. There have been patient deaths um, reported across the globe because of the failure to respond to these alarms due to alarm fatigue. Mm -hmm. And um, physiological monitoring devices are commonly used in critical care, and they're one of the primary sources of alarm fatigue. So these devices are used to monitor patient status and to guide treatment. Um, a common treatment is administering high alert critical short life infusions, such as vasoactive agents. So in the coronary care unit where my research takes place, a common vasoactive agent is nitroglycerin, and it's used for the relief of chest pain related to acute coronary syndrome. Unlike other medications, there is no standard dose for nitroglycerin because the impact of this medication varies greatly from patient to patient. So it requires manual titration uh, performed by the nurse, which is increasing or decreasing the rate um, to achieve therapeutic endpoint. Um, so for nitroglycerin, that could be starting the infusion at five to 10 micrograms a minute, and then increasing it every three to five minutes by five micrograms to um, achieve 
the goal of chest pain relief. And during this process, many physiological parameters such as blood pressure are monitored frequently to help titrate the dose. But it really comes down to the nurse's decision making to optimally titrate this medication. And with suboptimal titration, patients tend to experience side effects and it also triggers alarms by those physiological devices. And unfortunately, um, suboptimal titration of vasoactive medication is very common. So in a, in a study, they looked at the practice of nurses um, during titrating um, vasoactive infusions, and they found that from all the, all the titrations, only 8% of them were deemed to be tit uh, correctly titrated. And achieving optimal titration is very difficult. Um, in fact, uh, in another study, they spoke to critical care nurses and um, explored their experience. And the common response was that titrating these medications is difficult because it's hard to determine if the dose is too high or too low or what the effect would be if it was changed. So there's a lot of uncertainty in how a patient may respond to any change in dose. And since the impact varies from patient to patient, it, there is no one standard dose. And it really comes down to having research and tools available that assist in the decision making of nurses to have optimal titration. So the problem is that suboptimal titration of nitroglycerin is common, and there's really no systems available that provide any estimate of future blood pressure, which could be used to assist in nurses' decision making. Um, so my proposed solution is developing a nitroglycerin decision support system, which um, would provide a forecast of blood pressure predictions. And nurses can use this system to augment their experience, their education, and, um, and use that to uh, adjust the dose and hopefully have optimal titration, which would also prevent any alarms uh, from the devices. So in the context of nitroglycerin, it would be say that the system provides a, for, a prediction of blood pressure in five minutes from now, and the nurses take that prediction, they assess the patient, they use your experience and education, and they can adjust the dose to prevent any adverse effects. And with that optimal titration, it would um, reduce the alarms from physiological devices. So a similar system was developed um, where they looked at uh, developing an advisory system to predict blood pressure five minutes into the future for a different vasoactive agent. And when nurses used that advisory system, they were able to achieve the, uh, the target blood pressure in significantly less time. So in about four minutes compared to when they did manual titration, which was 10 minutes. So there is strong evidence that this is a potential solution that could really address this problem. And with that, my research is looking at developing this um, decision support system. It would provide a forecast of blood pressure predictions at the time of dose titration. And to do this, um, we've identified three core requirements that we think are necessary to optimize its use. So one, we want it to generate accurate predictions, um, because if it's not very accurate, it wouldn't be that useful. And second is we want it to be easy to use. Um, the reason being there's um, strong evidence that even highly accurate system tends to be rejected because they're very difficult to use and um, the interface is not user friendly. So the end users uh, tend to reject them. So to avoid that, we want our system to be very easy to use. And to do that, we're gonna be involving end users in designing this, um, this decision support system. And sorry. And the third um, core requirement, um, we're looking at um, our system to have very limited barriers in using it. And understanding these um, barriers early on could be helpful to develop implementation strategies. And hopefully that would reduce, um, that would improve the acceptance and reduce the, um, the barriers. So, Starting off with accurate predictions. Um, so patients in the coronary care unit, when they're receiving nitroglycerin, blood pressure tends to be monitored with this, this device. It's intermittent non-invasive. And with this, you tend to get blood pressure data at irregular intervals. And most, most models for forecasting time series data, such as blood pressure, assume that it's from regular intervals. So if we were to use this device, um, then we would have to consider this um, sampling irregularity, and overall the performance might not be as accurate as if we had regular interval data. 
Um, so there is this other technique. Um, it's the continuous invasive. It is available, however, not every patient um, is, requires continuous invasive monitoring. And with this, it requires cannulation of an artery, which is associated with risk. You need specialized equipment and trained staff. And it wouldn't be practical to just uh, use continuous invasive mon monitoring just for the sole purpose of getting data that we could use as the input for a decision support system. Um, so for that reason, we explored alternatives and we came across this continuous non-invasive device. So with this overcomes the limitation of um, sparse data and it doesn't require any cannulation. So um, this is a potential solution to getting um, data that we could use as the input. However, it's not clear how accurate this device is compared to the gold standard. So that uh, led us to our first study where we're looking at um, the blood pressure measurements from continuous non-invasive monitoring device accurate enough to be used as the input for a decision support system. And to answer that, we did a systematic review and meta-analysis, um, really comparing the continuous non-invasive technique to the gold standard invasive monitoring. And this study has been published in the Intensive and Critical Care Nursing Journal, in case anyone's interested. Um, so what we found was there was substantial difference between blood pressure that was obtained from the continuous non-invasive and invasive monitoring. In fact, the systolic and mean arterial pressure could be as much as 30 to 45 millimeters of mercury lower or higher higher than invasive monitoring recorded at the same time. Um, for our purpose, this, is, um, this would really lead to inaccurate uh, measurements because th that device is very inaccurate in capturing blood pressure. So if we were to use that as the input, our, our model probably wouldn't perform well. So it, it's not suitable to be used as the input for a decision support system. And this led us to um, the second study uh, where we were looking at the accuracy of machine learning models in predicting blood pressure at, time, uh, at the time of nitroglycerin dose titration using irregularly sampled data from the non-invasive devices. Uh, the study is still in the works, but our, it's a, our plan is um, to do like a retrospective observational design using data from the EIC database. Um, this is developed by Philips Healthcare, and it contains over 200,000 admissions and from 200 plus hospitals across the U.S. So the advantage of using this database is it's multi-center, which um, would result in the inclusion of a larger sample of patient and a more comprehensive range of patient population, which we hope will hopefully increase the generalizability of our study findings. So our general plans um, for this study, and it's following like the machine learning framework in that we're, once we have the raw data, we process looking at missing values, addressing the categorical variables and feature scaling just to standardize the predictors. And in terms of modeling, um, we're going to be using models based on prior research on dose titration and hemodynamic parameter um, predictions. And for each model, we would tune the parameters to, of course, um, optimize its accuracy and perform cross-validation. And since we would have repeated measurements from the uh, same participant, we're going to take that into account and ensure that no observations from an individual are in both, the, in both samples and in the cross-validation. Um, and to measure our performance, we're going to be looking at mean squared error between the actual and the predicted blood pressure. So again, this study is still in the works, and hopefully in the near future, I could present the results. Um, so now moving on to the second component of uh, this research, where we're looking at making a system easy to use. And to do this, we're going to be doing a qualitative persona scenario design, and then our research question is, the, what are the design requirements for user interface for this decision support system? Um, the persona scenario, it's a user center approach and it's a really good fit for um, this study because with the persona scenario design, it's a structured activity where participants, they'll work in pairs and they'll create a persona and then their persona will um, kind of navigate a story. So the users will give their persona like a name, age, gender, talk about their education background, their work experience and their comfort with technology. And then the persona will navigate the story. So for this study, it would be that the persona has been told there's a new system um, that assists in the decision-making related to titrating nitroglycerin. And how would you want this system to look and to communicate with um, you? So using guiding questions, like is this a standalone device or is this embedded into something that already exists? And what kind of information would you want communicated? And how would you want that communicated? Like is 
is it auditory is it visual so we would use a like an interview guide to walk through that um, an example of this is say uh, the persona is a 50 year old nurse their name's ivan and they have 15 years of critical care experience. They've been a charge nurse for a few years and they have extensive experience with titrating uh, medications. And they require, they're moderately comfortable with technology. They use like a phone, laptop, and at times they do require assistance with the electronic health record. And for Ivan, they would want the new system integrated into an existing device because they don't want another device at the bedside. And they want the system to basically provide just the rate and the infusion rate and the predicted blood pressure because there's already they feel as if there's already information overload and they don't want an auditory alert. So they want the predicted blood pressure to just be a pop up that they, they manually close and they want the interface to be very simple, just showing the graph of trending blood pressure. So by using this persona scenario activity, the goal is like you're able to identify really specific actionable ways to design the system that would be easy to use for the end users. And that's what we hope to um, achieve with this study. And um, so then the third uh, core requirement was looking at barriers to use. And for this, uh, we're doing a cross-sectional descriptive survey design, and it's answering two research questions. The first, we just want to know what are the perceived barriers of critical care nurses in using this decision support system for vasoactive medication. And we decided to focus more uh, broadly on just vasoactive medications rather than just nit nitroglycerin because the, the process for um, titrating is quite similar. They do require manual titration. And it would be nice to just have a general understanding of the nurses' perceived barriers. And um, so you might be thinking, why is it important to know the barriers if this technology doesn't even exist yet? And it's because technology acceptance is influenced by perceived barriers. So even before the users are introduced to um, a new technology, they develop certain perceptions of it. And if they feel that there's a lot of barriers to using it, they're more likely to not um, accept this in their practice uh, even before they are introduced to it. So understanding these perceived barriers in the early stages stages of technology acceptance is important because you can develop mitigation strategies um, that would address those barriers. And this will hopefully all, uh, lead to the acceptance and um, the uh, acceptance of this technology once we have a prototype and we do eventually implement it in practice. And then the second question is looking at the association between the perceived barriers and user characteristics. So like the age, gender, education, years of experience, and their experience with decision support systems. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the reason we're, we, we're, we wanna do that is because there's strong literature that suggests that user characteristics is useful to inform um, development of barrier mitigation strategy. For instance, age is a strong moderator in that young workers tend to want technology that uh, improves their job performance, whereas an older worker want technology that's easier to use. And so all these different user characteristics have an impact on the type of perceived barriers that a potential user might uh, have. And by, um, by looking into this, so if we know that a similar demographic of nurses report a commonly perceived barrier, then we can um, and develop some targeted interventions to address that demographic and that would hopefully lead to an acceptance by addressing those barriers. Um, so right now, um, at the future next step. So right now we're in the process of analyzing the EICU data. And in the coming months, we're gonna start recruitment and data collection for the persona scenario design, which will happen at Trillium Health Partners. And then for the survey research, um, which we're doing through the Canadian Critical Care Nursing Association. And in the future, we hope to build a prototype um, that can be further refined and tested. And then one day implemented in practice uh, to address this problem of suboptimal titration and alarm fatigue. Um, so thank you for attending my talk. And I do want to um, uh, acknowledge my research team. So my supervisor, Dr. Aaron Conway, and my committee members, Dr. Uh, Carl, um, Dr. Charlene Chu and Dr. Kelly Metcalf for their contribution to my research. So thank you. Tremendous job, uh, Napri. Wow. What an interesting uh, application was was very compelling. So I'm just going to put a call out for questions. 
to see if there's any uh, questions from the audience. Again, feel free to type in the chat uh, or raise your hand and I will come to you. Or, or be Alistair and just- Or just talk. <laughs> yeah. uh, Go for I, it. Sorry. sorry, my name's in all caps. I'm not yelling my name at you, but uh, I typed it in that way. I, I was wondering, do you have, I know you're just starting your analysis on EICU CRD, but do you have an idea of how you'll define the treatment in, in, in EICU um, in, in terms of, uh, obviously the, it's, it's, not, it's not a continuous feed from an infusion pump, right? It's not super ideal data. So I just wonder if you've thought about how you, how you would go about doing that. Yeah, so um, what we're looking at is we're looking at um, the 15 minute mark. So any blood pressure that was captured uh, 15 minutes after. So if they say they, the, uh, the blood pressure was an hour before, we wouldn't be including that because that would introduce too much noise. So we're looking at time frames that we're setting and um, look capturing data within that time frame just and then using that to uh, to work on the model. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then really quickly, do you have an idea of what approaches you might take? What? Um, like in terms of models? Uh, in terms of the modeling approach, yeah. The, the, yeah. Um, so reviewing the literature um, for what uh, and even other literature on just uh, dose pre uh, for predicting blood pressure, um, the, what where we want to start with more of the simpler ones like regression and then introducing lasso and ridge. And then there have been few studies that have shown that extreme gradient boosting is effective. So that's what we're looking at. And we're using literature to guide our decision. But I mean, once we get into the data and, and actually analyze, we'll see how um, how well it performs. Great, thank you. So Vin, over to you. Hi there, great work. It's uh, like, honestly, hats off to you for so many different research approaches and one PhD, that's no small feat. Um, I'm glad you mentioned how you're doing your recruitment for your survey through the uh, Canadian group of critical care nurses. That was gonna be one of my questions. Um, my second question was, um, you know, you're focusing on critical care and cardiac environments. How generalizable do you think your findings might be uh, to other units of the hospital where these tools may be deployed? Um, so it is like for nitroglycerin infusion, they tend not to be administered in like just the inpatient ward. It is because you do need specialized like training. So they tend to be more critical care platform. And then if it's for somebody who has chest pain and like the, the context is the same, I believe it would be generalizable. And the interesting thing, so for the EICU, it is a multi-center data set. So it's not looking at one single hospitals from uh, 200 plus hospitals and I believe 335 critical care units. So um, we are using, to develop this, we are using multi-center data. And then I'm hoping um, that would, increase the generalizability. And then in a practical context, I think any, like the titrician practice is pretty much standard across, um, like the protocol is pretty standard uh, in different hospitals and even in the US and here. So if we, if this decision support system was very accurate, I think it would be generalizable to other settings that are like more critical care because in the regular inpatient unit that you wouldn't have, um, vasoactive infusions. So in critical care, I think it would be quite generalizable. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> what about other drugs, like for example, insulin or other nursing environments with um, different drugs, but sort of similar workflows? Yeah, so like I haven't looked at insulin, but more vasoactive infusion. So the other, they all have similar process in terms of your titrating to achieve therapeutic endpoints. So like for my research, I'm not, that's not the medication that I'm looking at, but I think future research could explore that. And there have been some past research that looked at other vasoactive infusions, but in terms of insulin, um, I haven't read the literature on that or how that would um, carry out, but that, that's... That's a good point. Great, thanks so much. No problem. Great, I think if there's no other questions, I will ask one if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just wondering, and it's a little bit on the validation of your model. And also, you know, also wanna echo what Vin said, like I think it's just amazing that you're actually thinking 
of the whole pipeline in your thesis work, like you're thinking about the design side and you're thinking about usability and barriers, which is fantastic. On the model itself, though, on the on the validation, is there going to be an opportunity to do validation work or even development work on the data at Trillium in the hospital that you're intending to test the deployment? Um, that like because it's that would take a lot of time, and because it is a PhD, I do want to finish on time, hopefully. So um, that is something I'm looking at, or even looking at a prospective study, more so a postdoc. Um, yeah. But for this research, I wouldn't like. Um, I, I that's not what I'm aiming for. But for a postdoc, so as a potential um, way to approach that, like you could you could test that, and also you could bring into alarm fatigue to see if this system actually reduces the number of alarms. Um, but for the purpose of this study and this research at this point, that's not um, that's not what I'm focusing on. But that is a good point. And that's something I hope to tap into during a postdoc. For sure. And uh, <laughs> totally understandable. And, you know, some, someone should do it. It doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be uh, you, especially in the context of one PhD. So um, again, I just want to thank you again for, for presenting this research to our community. It's a, it's a really excellent example of the application. Uh, wish you all the best of luck. Very exciting. Hopefully you'll come back uh, with results and share with our community because I know that many people will be very interested. So thank you again, uh, for, you know, virtual and uh, <laughs> go around the yeah, lot. Thank you. And, uh, and we'll move next uh, to our next speaker, Ryan. So Ryan, if you can just come up and uh, share your screen and I will introduce you. Uh, reminder to everybody that you're welcome to put in questions in the chat um, while the presentation's happening and I'll come to them in the Q&A portion. So I'll just wait for, uh, make sure your slides are good to go. Yeah, and, one second. Yeah, it's showing, uh, it's not in presentation mode, but I think you just said. Okay. Yeah, that looks perfect. Can see okay. it there? We can see it perfectly. So I'm going to introduce uh, Ryan to everyone. So again, we're very fortunate to have another fantastic uh, speaker today, Ryan Daniel, who holds a Bachelor of Science with honors in translational me and molecular medicine. And he's now in his third year of medical school here at the University of Toronto. He's worked in a variety of settings from basic science to clinical research, and he now works as a machine learning researcher at SickKids Hospital. And I think we'll hear a bit about that research today. Uh, Ryan's very passionate about providing the, the highest level of patient-centered care, and he believes that embracing AI and medicine will help make this goal a reality. So welcome, Ryan. We uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, so... Uh, I just want to thank TKM again for giving me this opportunity. Um, maybe not as seasoned as some of the other uh, training rounds participants, but uh, very, very happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to be presenting my research, which is a, you know, part of a larger team of, uh, of, of researchers entitled Machine Learning Based Innovation in Ocular Pediatric Assessment Using Point of Care Ultrasound. Um, so to start off with, I want all of us to go to the following clinical scenario. Uh, so imagine that you're a clinician working in the sick kids emergency department, uh, and you have the following two patients during one of your shifts. Uh, you have a five-year-old boy uh, who's had four months of on and off headaches, uh, and maybe isn't playing like he, he usually does. And then you have another patient, a 17-year-old female with a two-month history of on and off headaches, and, and maybe some of those headaches are waking up from sleep. So it, it, we come to this clinical dilemma in this situation of, you know, both of these patients could have a benign cause of their headache, but there also is the uh, terrible possibility uh, that they could have intracranial pathology, uh, like say a brain tumor. Um, so as an emergency phys uh, physician, it's difficult because we need to determine how do we risk stratify these patients uh, for further neural imaging, uh, like MRI. Um, and specifically, that's important because MRIs are extremely resource intensive and they aren't without risk. So at SickKids, uh, it's estimated that it costs, it costs about $1,000 per sedated scan, and that's just the human cost only. So not the maintenance and all the, the other types of things that go on top of it. There's also the risk. So uh, anesthetic agents are often needed uh, when you uh, MRI a pediatric patient. 
uh, and they can also lead to prolonged emergency department stays. So there's a risk there. Uh, and then just the practicality of it all is that there's 7,000 kids uh, on the wait list right now uh, for the sick kids MRI. Um, so that kind of puts things in perspective. So in an absence of neurological symptoms, one of the ways that uh, we can properly risk stratify these patients uh, is actually by looking at the eye. Um, so the eye is actually connected anatomically to the brain uh, because the covering of the brain, also known as the meninges, uh, actually extend all the way along the optic nerve and attach into the retina. And therefore, if you have uh, intracranial pathology like a brain tumor or hydrocephalus, so that would be an obstruction of the ventricles in your brain, um, then that can lead to detectable changes uh, at the back of the eye and the retina, and more specifically around the optic disc and fundus. Um, and collectively, those changes in the eye secondary to increased intracranial pressure are known as papilledema. Uh, and so what we know is that there's been several studies um, that, that have shown that the diagnostic utility of neuroimaging in pediatric patients uh, with headaches is overall pretty low. But if you have a pediatric patient with a headache and papilledema, then we know that the diagnostic yield for neuroimaging increases drastically. So basically, how, how do we assess the back of the eye? Um, so since the 1860s, fundoscopy with an ophthalmoscope, which is shown here on the right, uh, has been kind of the traditional method that's been used to examine the retina for abnormalities like papilledema. Uh, and what we know is that competent assessment of the fundus uh, is a duty of care for all physicians. Uh, and there is international consensus that all graduate medical students should be competent uh, in direct fundoscopy uh, for assessment of papilledema. So I'm just going to show this video, which is an example of a fundoscopic uh, exam in the clinical setting. So as you can see, the clinician is using the ophthalmoscope. He's shining a, a brief beam of light that's supposed to go through the pupil, uh, and then he's able to get small views uh, of the retina. And So while the video made it look somewhat easy, uh, in, the, in the clinical setting, doing ophthalmoscope uh, or doing fundoscopy is extremely difficult uh, and it's almost impossible to get clear images of the optic disc uh, if you're not very, very well trained and very seasoned. Um, and it's even more difficult when you think of the context of a pediatric patient uh, where you need to keep them completely still. Uh, and oftentimes you have to use dilating drops uh, to be able to get a better view through the pupil. Um, so with that said, there's overwhelming amount of evidence, as you can see on this slide. Um, the clinicians are, first of all, they're not confident uh, in, performing fun in performing fundoscopy. Um, they aren't doing it. Uh, and overall, we're just completely incompetent at performing this task, uh, by and large, outside of probably ophthalmologists. And this is an issue because those two patients uh, that we saw that I kind of described in the first slide, um, that's not an abnormality. These are not, uh, you know, rare cases of, of patients presenting with headaches to the emergency department. Uh, it's estimated that about 10% of all visits uh, uh, to sick kids are, are for headache or vomiting. And in the literature, that number uh, may be even higher to around 15%. So we're left with this dilemma of, well, how are we going to assess uh, the back of the eye? Uh, and look for papilledema so that we can better risk stratify patients uh, if we're completely incapable of doing fundoscopy. Uh, and the solution to this is ocular point of care ultrasound. Um, so this is basically the same type of technology that is traditional ultrasound um, that is used to examine the fetus during pregnancy. And basically there's a firing of, of uh, sound waves in, into the patient uh, and based on the different densities of the tissue that it interacts with, it will reflect back. And then on the screen, you will get a grayscale image uh, that basically allows you to uh, examine the, uh, the uh, anatomy inside the body. And so I'm just going to do a brief clip of ocular point of care ultrasound. Um, and uh, hopefully that gives a little bit of context. So here we can see the probe uh, is being uh, run over the patient's eye with a thing of tagoderm and some gel. 
Um, and, and basically th that's as easy as it is. You can see, uh, you know, the patient doesn't have to stay completely, completely still. Um, and uh, there, there seems to be quite a few advantages uh, versus fundoscopy because uh, point of care ultrasound is widely available now. Uh, it can be used for multiple different um, applications outside of ocular focus. Uh, and uh, for instance, medical students at Stanford now are, are not getting a stethoscope practice in point of care ultrasounds. Um, so this is really the, the next wave forward. Um, and so in terms of ocular point of care ultrasound um, uh, to assess for papilledema, recent studies have shown uh, that in pediatrics, we have very good sensitivity and specificity uh, when you compare to the gold standard uh, invasive pressure measurements and a similar story in adults. Uh, and basically these are still images of, of point of care ultrasound scans here on the left. Uh, uh, a would be uh, a normal scan and B would be a scan with papilledema. And if you can imagine uh, that the probe is sitting at the top of these images and then it's cutting through uh, a transverse plane of the, of the eye. Uh, and then you have the globe here, the retina, uh, and then this would be the optic nerve uh, and the optic sheath, which is surrounding it. Uh, so the main sign on ocular point of care ultrasound that, that indicates we have increased pressure in the brain uh, and that this needs to be addressed ur urgently uh, is this optic disc elevation that you can see here. And basically what this is, is a translation of the pressure from the head uh, into the optic nerve and then that bulges into the globe and you get this optic disc elevation. So, um, as, as ocular focus continues to boom uh, and uh, it continues to move forward, uh, we really want to, to ask the question if we can use machine learning to automate detection of papilledemia in pediatric patients from these ocular point of care ultrasound scans to make a technology that's becoming even more uh, uh, available, uh, even more accessible, maybe to even uh, non-technical users and a various other applications. Um, so like any machine learning project, first we have to start off with getting some data. Uh, and thankfully for us at in the SickKids emergency department, um, emergency physicians have been uh, getting scans, ocular focus scans for almost a decade now. So since 2013. Uh, and so every time an uh, emergency physician uh, gets an ocular focus scan in the SickKids ER, they will enter uh, that scan into the QPath E uh, imaging database, which is just for storage. Um, and then they will give a preliminary diagnosis and they will send it off for quality assessment. Uh, and the process of quality assessment is performed by an ocular focus expert. So somebody who's had uh, additional training in point of care ultrasound or done a fellowship in point of care ultrasound. Uh, and they're basically assessing three main things from these scans. They're assessing that first of all, there's adequate view that you can actually see pathology. So that's kind of a binary yes, no. Uh, then they'll make the, uh, uh, they'll look at the interpretation of the initial clinician uh, and, and uh, basically say, do they agree or do they disagree uh, with the accuracy of that interpretation? And then they'll give a final diagnosis. And for our purposes, we were interested in either is this papilledema or is this normal? Um, and so ultimately, uh, what that left us with in the QPATH e database is a labeled data set uh, from ocular focus experts um, that can serve as basically our reference standard uh, for a machine, our machine learning project. Um, so we wanted to go out with a supervised learning machine learning approach. Uh, and uh, we went ahead and extracted uh, 1,196 patients at the time of the preliminary work that I'm gonna be presenting right uh, in just in a couple minutes. Uh, and then we also extracted another 2,805 uh, patients since then. Uh, and the database is continually growing. It's a live database. Uh, and we will continue to, to draw down images and, uh, and build our, our data set that way. So our first approach, um, was basically to see, is there actually any signal uh, in, in our data set? Uh, and is it really worth us investing a lot of time and money um, into this problem? Um, and, and so basically what we started off with was a simple fully connected convolutional neural network uh, with GradCam. Uh, and we basically would feed in uh, a DICOM image. Uh, and after going through some pre-processing, so 
removing some of the personal health information data uh, and basically cropping down the image a little bit to make sure that uh, we're getting rid of some of the noise associated with the ocular polarity ultrasound scans. Um, then we fed it into our model uh, and the binary output would be either papilledema or no papilledema. Uh, and so we were pretty excited about our initial results. Uh, our AURC curve uh, was 0 0.9, uh, so pretty good. Uh, and, and what was even more exciting for us uh, is that when we use grad, grad cam for explainability of the model and to understand where was it uh, focusing on to make the biggest predictions, it was focusing on the exact place where it wanted to, uh, which is at the very back of the retina at the intersection with the optic nerve. And we can see here in this image that you have this optic disc elevation, which is con consistent uh, with papilledema. So we were, we were very excited with this, with this result. To start. Um, so, well, uh, sorry. So uh, we then continued on to uh, a, a new model, uh, more of a sliding window model uh, that's also still connect, fully connected convolutional neural network. Uh, and the real point of this uh, was to see if we can uh, get a little bit more temporality. So instead of inputting one die column image at a time, we inputted five. Uh, and then had the same binary output of uh, uh, papilledema or no papilledema. Um, and so we were pleased to see that our model performance increased quite a bit. Uh, so from 0.9 to 0.95 on the AURC curve. Uh, and then, uh, but then upon examining our precision recall curve, uh, what we found is that, you know, we're, we're able to classify the true positives uh, but we are having quite a few uh, false positives. Um, and, and so that really prompted us to, to look at some further analysis and, and, and why this was happening. And so what we found uh, is that in looking at some of our false positives uh, is that uh, some of them had actually been labeled inappropriately. So the ground truth was actually inappropriate uh, in that um, ones that were labeled as no papilledema actually were papilledema. So our model was actually doing the right thing and labeling them as papilledema, um, but it was just a labeling error that was causing some of those issues. Uh, and in the red boxes we have here are some of the examples, although it might be a little bit tough to see. Um, so basically our, our group, our group uh, decided that you know, our, our initial next step uh, will be kind of the low, low hanging fruit of trying to go back through with our focus experts uh, and make sure that our labeling is sound in our ground truths. Um, and then we have our kind of next steps, uh, which uh, very excitingly, uh, our entire group uh, was just awarded the Timurti uh, Innovation Grant. Uh, and basically our next steps are as follows. So aim number one uh, is to basically take our current model and actually build out a segmentation model uh, with a unit architecture, which I'll show in, in a second. Aim number two is incorporation of red flag symptoms in addition to our ocular focus um, uh, images to make uh, a more informed prediction uh, with historical features. And then aim number three was perspective validation and translation uh, into the clinical setting. Um, so I'll briefly go through these aims. Um, so aim number one, as I said, uh, was to, to build out a segmentation model. Uh, and uh, we're really going to be focusing on using the unit architecture. Uh, and that'll be the hands of our, in the hands of our um, computer science uh, experts. Um, and, you know, really the goal here is to limit some of the noise uh, that's being picked up. Um, by our model uh, and you know, the segmentation could be something along these lines of segmenting out the optic nerve, uh, the retina and the globe uh, and allowing for uh, a, a, more, uh, a more effective model. So aim number two uh, is to incorporate red flag symptoms um, uh, along, with, uh, along with our focus imaging data. Uh, so to do that, uh, we'll have to uh, extract um, uh, extract these features uh, from the EPIC EHR database using CUI codes. Um, and, and then we'll put, we will potentially explore using natural language processing uh, transform models uh, that have been pre-trained on medical data sets like MedBERT. Um, uh, and that, that would be more for the, the free text medical documentation. Uh, and so we'll have these features of headache, vomiting, 
nighttime waking, weight change, vision change. And, and we chose these because these are red flags that there possibly could be intracranial pathology um, just outside of just having a normal headache. Uh, and then we'll hopefully get to the point where we can feed them in as binary outputs uh, in, in a beautiful uh, interactive interface uh, with an, uh, a phone application uh, that will basically pop up the ocular focus image with some explainability of, of the decision it came to of why, why it was saying uh, papilledema or why it was saying no papilledema. And then also with the toggling of each of those red flag symptoms could then give a more global interpretation of whether this patient, um, you know, the probability of this patient having uh, intracranial pathology. And then finally, uh, of course, this is kind of a fi final step of any machine learning project would be perspective validation and then translation in, uh, into, the, uh, into the clinical practice. Um, so that'll be done at SickKids. And as I said, kind of similar type of thing to the last slide, we'll be using those binary future inputs. Uh, we'll be using POCUS and, and we'll have to coordinate a lot of things to make sure that or, or hope that things are happening in real time uh, so that it can really help clinicians be more informed and make better decisions for the patients like I presented at the start. Um, so ultimately this comes to the conclusion of my talk, um, which is um, you know, this problem I discussed today of uh, being able to properly risk stratify patients who are presenting with concerning symptoms of intracranial pathology uh, for neuroimaging is extremely important. Um, we believe that, you know, with successful clinical deployment uh, of a model like ours, um, that these patients will have faster diagnosis, faster treatment, better outcomes, and ultimately have less resource ut utilization, because hopefully the people that need neuroimaging are getting neuroimaging and the people that aren't uh, don't. Uh, and then finally, um, building out our model, uh, I believe there's, there is, um, you know, the potential for translation to adults. We know that uh, a pediatric patient's eye re reaches the size of an adult uh, at the age of three. Um, so definitely uh, can, can possibly be translated to adult applications uh, and maybe even doing some transfer learning approaches for other uh, ocular pathologies that we can detect. Um, so thank you so much for listening. I, I want to uh, thank my amazing AI ball, AI ball team uh, headed by Dr. Devin Singh uh, and a lot of other incredible computer scientists uh, and clinicians and researchers. So um, thank you so much for listening. Amazing, uh, amazing work, amazing presentation, uh, Ryan. Totally uh, fascinating. Lots to lots to talk about. So I'm just gonna put a call out to the questions. Again, you can type them in the chat, or you can um, raise your hand, and I'm I'll be happy to take them. Or you can just talk, Alistair. Oh, you raised your hand. I did. I raised all three of my hands. Um, Double raised hand. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, had, I had two two questions. One very quickly, what um, saliency technique did you use in particular? Sorry? The, the saliency, the, um, the approach you used for the interpretability uh, on the images, do you know what? So uh, what I'll say is that, uh, you know, a lot of the interpretability stuff was done by uh, Marta and Fatim on our team. Okay. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly exactly how it was done, so, um, yeah. but I can definitely uh, find well, out and, and send you an email if interested. No, I mean I'll get to the point. I guess that some some you know there were some approaches that made sense, um, but then there's been some investigation into some of the more recent ones, like guided grad, grad cam, guided back prop, and a lot of them actually just emulate edge detectors and are okay. totally independent of your neural network. And there's a few of them which, you know, are capturing what your network is looking at, but then mm -hmm. there are a few of them which are just very fancy edge detectors and, and uh, are the, the interpretation is independent of, of the image. So because you're sort of looking at an edge, it's something yeah. that I think, and there's a paper called um, Sanity Checks for Saliency Maps. Um, so okay. it might not be an issue, but I think it's worth looking at because, because it's so important. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. Oh, hey, Devin. The, the hey, <laughs> pretty good. I'm just at work, but I'm kind yeah. of snooping in on here just to help Brian with some of the more technical questions. But you're, yeah. you're totally spot on, Alistair. We definitely have that on our radar. Yeah, um, cool. If you have the paper, it might be interesting for the yeah, audience sure. if you post the link in the chat. Yeah, that's um, the technique that Ryan displayed was just a simple, like, off-the-shelf grad cam okay. uh, technique. Well, that's the one that we, works. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we did um, we did explore um, sh using Shapley values as well. Um, he he excluded that slide. It's just because we were trying different things. So we're keeping very open minded with um, many different techniques, both on the modeling side, but on on the explainability side. But uh, the grad cam seemed to work the best, and the output um, was nice and intuitive uh, as a heat map. Yeah. 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 Good, cool. Uh, and then my second question was on you know you found these labeling errors did you did you adopt a, a sort of a systematic approach to identifying these labeling errors so i've seen some researchers who actually sort of like a form of active learning to identify mislabeled um, images and it, 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 the approach more or less it ranks it ranks images based off how unexpected it mm -hmm. is that the model is wrong about it so so did you look at any of that uh, I don't believe we've done that, but again, that's that's another really good uh, suggestion, uh, yeah, and, cool. and we'll look well, into that. I was looking for the. I'll try and find the paper and, and send it to you. I don't know where it is. Awesome, so you're you're helping us out. I appreciate it, <laughs> Alistair. <Alistair. laughs> no, it's cool. It's uh, that's the benefit of then. Yeah, 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 this is this is Steve Karam, right? You know, I haven't found yeah. an excuse to use it yet because it looks so cool. <laughs> yeah, that's the benefit to presenting to the community because. Uh, you know, all of these issues, sanity checks, as well as the labeling error is uh, a very common problem uh, in AI mm -hmm. medicine. So I think more uh, getting deeper on that would be fantastic. Okay, Philippe, over to you. Hey Ryan, really great presentation. Hey. Really, really fascinating. Um, I had a quick question about uh, data acquisition. So how much of an issue or non-issue is um, like variability in the technique of acquiring the ultrasound image. So I'm thinking about issues of like different angles at which the transducer is held to the eye. In this specific context, is it an issue? Yeah, so that, that's actually a good question and something that we're, we're actively looking at. So the, the data set we have is not just from one type of uh, ultrasound machine actually, because uh, there's a couple in the sick kids emergency department. Um, so, you know, we haven't explored yet uh, how our model is performing uh, just based on, you know, one ultrasound machine's images versus the other versus the other. Uh, but that would be something definitely that is kind of next steps interesting to explore. Um, and uh, in, in terms of variability in the image acquisition, um, you know, the majority of the scans that we've used to this point uh, were performed by uh, fellows that had actually done POCUS. So we, we've kind of excluded uh, the scans that were done uh, just by you know, not just by, but by emergency uh, physicians who didn't have extra training. So we're kind of starting with the best data uh, and seeing how we do, uh, and then we'll kind of incorporate from there. Um, but, uh, but great question and something that's definitely on our radar. Got it. Thank All right. Any, uh, again, I'm going to go back to the data labeling, uh, question because I think that this is something that um, we need to actually tackle to, in AI medicine more broadly. Can you um, tell me a little bit more about the labeling? And it sounds like that, that's something that you're in, like, how is it done? How do you ensure quality? How do you ensure it's done in a systematic way? Is that something that's yeah. at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I talked a little bit about how it's, how it's being done. Um, that right now we're only using scans that are being quality assessed by a POCUS expert. Um, you know, there are other scans in the data, database that haven't been sent for quality assessment that we've, we've uh, excluded for now. Uh, and there's, there's two kind of major POCUS experts um, that are performing a lot of the quality assessment. Um, and, you know, there is a chance that there is some variability uh, in the interpretation and certainly we recognize that. Um, and, and, you know, Mark Tessero, who's who's a, kind of a, a world leading expert in ocular focus, is on our team, um, and, and we'll kind of be reassessing some of the labeling that was done. So, is it standard uh, to report on the quality? So, it would be very typical in an epidemiologic study to report on, say, interrater reliability of whoever's doing these quality assessments or the performance characteristics. Is that something mm -hmm. that's standard, or uh, you think there's a role for that? So, sorry, just not. 
So that work, um, Ryan, I might jump in because that would have been done yeah, sort of sure. before your before your time. There was a lot of work that um, our POCUS team at Sickens did around looking at inter uh, like the the difference and the variation between how different scanners will report and if there was a significant difference. And they also then looked at um, how much experience is actually needed in order to reduce that variability between um, ultrasound scanners. Uh, and they found that it, it's like actually not too much. Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but certainly that inter um, sort of scanner variability uh, is quite low in our department, particularly because we have um, like a tight knit group of people who are in incredibly expert um, making those labels. And so when we translate out to other sites though, um, certainly that is a that may be an issue that we have to address, but it's not currently one um, that we're concerned about here in at uh, Sickens in the Emerge. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, thank you so much. Any other final uh, comments or questions? Just checking the chat. All right. Otherwise, I just want to, again, give a big round of applause uh, to Ryan. That was excellent work. I also just want to mention Ryan was one of uh, our inaugural summer uh, TKRM student uh, award winners. And uh, just a shout out to everyone that the call for TKRM uh, st summer studentships will be coming out towards the end of the year. So uh, if you're interested or you know trainees that are interested, it's a great uh, opportunity to have a uh, an experience in the summer in AI and medicine. And um, <laughs> I think Ryan's have been a great example of that. So thank you both, uh, Napreet and Ryan, and all of you for joining and for such a rich discussion. It's just amazing to see the work our, our trainees are doing. And uh, we have one more uh, left, the, the final two speakers for the year. Uh, we also will be launching a call again for our speaker series, trainee speaker series next year. So look out for that as well. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day. And thanks again to our, our speakers today.